Welcome to the Thermal Review, your go-to podcast for demystifying the world of infrared thermography. I'm your host, David Purcell, and today we have a special treat for you. In this episode, we're revisiting a previously recorded interview with Marcus Terran, president and CEO of Mobitherm, and my co-host. Together, we'll dive deep into the topic of navigating infrared camera enclosures. We'll explore why these enclosures are critical, especially in challenging and potentially explosive environments. We'll uncover the unique differences between infrared and visible camera enclosures, clarifying why you can't use just any enclosure. Finally, we'll guide you through the critical considerations for selecting the ideal enclosure, considering environmental and camera specific factors. By the end of this episode, you'll be well equipped to protect your valuable thermal imaging equipment effectively. So without further ado, let's hear from Marcus Terran, the expert behind the insights you're about to discover. Mr. Terran, good day. Mr. Purcell, same to you. <clears throat> Thank good to be you. On this channel. <laughs> it is good to be on this channel. And this is a great topic uh, for us to be discussing. I know we get lots of questions around enclosures. We get lots of questions around the type of enclosure for the type of environment for the type of the camera. And it is somewhat of a mystery. It's, I wish it was easier. I wish you could just, you know, easily, you know, select the, uh, an enclosure, any enclosure for your infrared camera, but there are things to consider. So that's yeah. why, uh, we decided to, uh, cover this topic in this podcast. And I, I think the best place to start Marcus is, you know, why, why do you even need enclosures for infrared cameras? So I'm hoping Marcus, you can kind of share, cause you've been doing enclosures for a long time. You could kind of yeah. share your experience. Why, why, why are enclosures for IR cameras even needed? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, especially when you consider, um, a lot of these cameras these days have already, let's say an IP 67 sort of a, uh, you know, environmental protection rating. So then the question becomes, well, why, why do I need an additional enclosure around it? If this is an outdoor rated camera, right? Yeah. So those are the very excellent questions. So sometimes the environment gets really brutal, if you will, there's a lot of grime, a lot of dust, you know, contaminations floating around, right? So yeah, even the camera is protected. Um, who wants to have like a half an inch buildup? On the camera every week to clean off right that sort of thing so so that's that's one of the reasons that we often recommend like hey it would be probably best to put an additional protective layer around the camera for example right um another area of of concern is the the, the front glass of the lens mm. of the of the camera uh, since we're dealing with thermal cameras is often germanium um, and it's a bit sensitive so if you have a lot of stuff flying around you want to make sure um, that doesn't get scratched or damaged or contaminated again. So, um, because the replacing the lens on a thermal camera is is a big deal. It, it it's very expensive, several thousand dollars typically, and it also requires you to take the camera out of commission, send it in for service, get a new re uh, replacement lens, put on a new calibration. I mean, it's a big deal, right? Yeah. Um, nobody wants to deal with it. Whereas if you have um, a thermal camera enclosure, you have a window. It's also made out of germanium, but um, you know it's easier to clean, and it, if it does get damaged, it's easier to replace, right? And it's not as costly, and it protects your camera. So that's really, in a nutshell, uh, why that is. And it's just, um, you know, thermal cameras tend to be still quite expensive, so it's really an additional uh, protection and 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 kind of like an insurance, if you will, around your valuables, uh, just to make sure there's an extra layer of safety around it. Right? Absolutely, yeah, and you know, re replacing the, the window on the enclosure in some cases can be done by the user in the field, right? I mean, in some cases yeah. where you have specialty uh, enclosures for, you know, explosion proof probably need to have some precautions around that, but that's, that's, that's a lot easier, like you said, than someone sending in their camera being out of commission, waiting for a repair to happen. And exactly. I, I, I know, I know we can't mention, uh, you know, customer names here on the podcast, uh, without permissions and approval. Uh, but I've, I've seen some images of cameras that, that Movitherm 
has brought back <laughs> for servicing <laughs> that have been caked with all sorts of stuff, um, dust, uh, you know, heavy sludge, uh, depending upon the environment that could have been avoided had, had they been in an enclosure. Right. And we, I'm remembering, <laughs> that's probably what you're referring to. This one case where, um, <laughs> I, I would have bet money on that, that camera was complete, a complete loss, but it was actually still working after we cleaned it up. It was, it was actually still functioning, which was amazing. Uh, but yeah, I mean that, that those are exactly those kind of examples where, you know, that's kind of, um, you know, to be considered uh, a good yeah. candidate for, for an enclosure, right? It definitely, that particular situation, yeah, we're thinking the same one. It speaks to the robustness of, of that particular camera and that camera brand. But, uh, wow, I, I, that's probably not normal uh, that, that the camera would survive such an environment. I'd, I'd, I'd like to help our listeners understand why, why they can't, or why you anyone can't use, you know, just a standard enclosure off the shelf, or let's say a visible camera, for a thermal camera. Uh, maybe you can explain why you have to have an enclosure specifically designed for thermal. Yeah, that's another good point. Um, so we're dealing, uh, unlike with um, a standard surveillance camera or something, we, we're dealing with a different wavelength of of light, if you will. Um, that is not visible to the human eye, right? So for standard cameras, you, you put a piece of glass, a piece of plastic in front of it, it can see through it and it's all it's all good. Yeah. Um, if you put a thermal camera in an outdoor enclosure that is intended to be for a regular daylight um, camera for visible light, um, the image will be black. There will be, the camera <laughs> will not be able to see anything. And the reason for that is that the glass does not transmit those wavelengths at all. So it looks completely opaque to the thermal camera. And um, we actually had a case where a customer did that. Um, they put a camera behind a plexiglass um, and they basically called us and said, hey, um, our camera's not working. We're, we're, we're seeing a black image. There's nothing happening. It's just some noise coming. And then we were like, what's going on? We tested the camera. The camera's just fine. What are you doing? <laughs> and then we found out <laughs> that they were putting it behind a piece of plexiglass. So, um, you know, it, again, same same situation, right? Whether it's regular glass or silicate BK7, or if it's, um, you know, a plexiglass um, uh, polycarbonate or something, any, any sort of uh, visibly translucent material may not be translucent uh, to the thermal camera in that wave band, right? And that's the reason why we use ex um, exotic optics is what we call them. Hmm. Those are basically semiconductors, if you will. You know, germanium is a semiconductor material, but it happens to be transmissive um, almost entirely in, in the long wave. Um, and and uh, even there's, there's materials for mid wave as well. Zinc selenite comes to mind. Um, so we, we need to consider specific materials um, that are tuned properly and coded properly for the particular camera in its particular wave band, right? That it's sensitive to. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So I, re I remember, and I won't, I won't give all the details, but I remember years ago seeing a video. It was actually, I think it was from an infrared camera that was mounted to a helicopter or something like that. And it was showing, it was a bad guy. And the bad guy initially was in a truck and you couldn't see him, couldn't see him at all. But the bad guy stepped out of the truck and became instantly visible in the infrared spectrum. And had, had he, had he stayed while well, I'm assuming it was a, he, I think it was, had he stayed in the truck, he probably could have avoided being detected at all. Uh, but in the end, it, it, it turned out not so great for the bad guy uh, because he did uh, exit the truck was visible to thermal and was detected. Yeah. So excellent point. With regards to uh, uh, heat dissipation and 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 temperature at which infrared cameras run, uh, Marcus, uh, do they do they uh, run any differently? The visible cameras, is there any kind of special like uh, you know conduction or, or 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 heating requirements even for infrared cameras that perhaps aren't as uh, you know necessary for visible cameras? Yeah, it's it's every time you have um, a protection because of heat, we, we have to ask ourselves several questions, right? So is the environment that the camera is going to go into um, essentially going to be exceeding the operating 
conditions, um, the maximum operating temperature for the camera that you're trying to, to enclose in there or, or operate in that environment with or without enclosure, right? That's the first thing you're going to look at. Yeah. Um, and sometimes the situation is, well, most of the time, yes, but sometimes we have a process where something very hot comes by um, and the camera would be overheated potentially for, let's say, a short period of time, a few seconds. Um, so even those few seconds, even if the camera survives that, it will over time degrade the camera and, and shorten mm -hmm. the lifetime of the camera, right? So yes, you can close both eyes and say, yeah, it's not that bad because it's just a few seconds. But if it's on a repetitive schedule, uh, it will definitely uh, you know, burn out the electronics eventually, right? So because all the components inside the camera will on a regular basis overheat and, and, and exceed their, their specifications. And that's just not a good thing. Gotcha. So, so you have to consider the environmental temperature conditions. Um, there's other conditions, obviously, um, but let, let's just talk about temperature right now. So, so that's, that's one thing. Then, then the question is low. Um, again, is it, is it radiative heat coming from an object that you're looking at? Is it heat? Is it because the air around the camera enclosure is, let's say, permanently hot? Is the air moving? Those are all considerations in terms of um, the, the, the convection mechanism that is going to affect um, the enclosure, or is the enclosure just outside, let's say, in Nevada or Arizona, in, in a desert kind of a region, and we have the, the radiative impact of the sun, and can we can we uh, kind of shield this with a sun shield to make sure we mm -hmm. have an additional layer of metal on top that's very reflective, so that the, the sun radiation is not going to be heating up the enclosure all that much, right? So surface finish of the enclosure becomes very important if we have, uh, we have these um, very shiny, looks almost like chrome plated. It's actually electro polished stainless steel. And there's a reason for that surface finish because it is a very low emissivity surface. And, and, and what that means is that um, if, if, if sun radiation hits it, it's like a mirror. So it doesn't absorb the heat from the sun. So it keeps it naturally cool already, which is great for operating in 120, 130 sort of degrees environments there. And so that passive called sort of a protection mechanism is typically sufficient to keep the camera inside uh, below its maximum operating temperatures, right? So yeah. that's that's the environmental temperature, the heat that, that has an impact on the outside of the enclosure. But we also at the same time have to consider the, the self-heating of the camera or any mm -hmm. device that we put into this enclosure. It could be more than a camera. It could be a little computer. It could be all kinds of other things, uh, power supply and so forth. So we really have to figure out, okay, what is the total heat dissipation of the devices combined that we put inside the enclosure and how big is that space inside the enclosure, right? So we have now have to go back to high school physics class. We have a, a, a combination of convection that is basically the, the heat radiated into the air environment inside the enclosure. And then we have also a conduction where we have an actual metal to metal surface that's conducting the heat away from the camera. So we need to get rid of the heat that's being produced. Let's say we have a 15 watt heat dissipation inside, right? Just as an assumption. Yeah. Um, so there's a, basically you can think of it as a light bulb, a 15 watt light bulb inside or a heater, basically 15 watt heater inside the enclosure now that's continuously producing heat. Well, that that heat needs to be dissipated. And, and first, it's multiple steps. First, it needs to be dissipated away from the camera itself. But you can't just have it inside accumulating because then you get what we call thermal runaway, right? So you can't just pump more and more and more heat. And if the capacity to cool uh, the, 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 that environment is basically the, the size of the enclosure and the total surface area. If that doesn't have the capacity to get rid of that heat that's being produced on the inside, in addition to being heated from the outside, <laughs> then you have um, a situation. So if, if the inside heat dissipation is greater than its capacity to cool, uh, while we're considering the outside heat influences, uh, you're going to get an, an effect of thermal runaway and, and slowly the heat will creep up and creep up and creep up and you will you will destroy the camera um, that's in there so so those calculations have to be considered um, in the environment right yeah so let's say you you let's say you do the calculations and you you realize we don't have enough effective you know conduction off of the surface of the enclosure into the environment you let's say you're in a pretty extreme 
area, high temperatures, um, what can you do? What are the, what are the options uh, for for removing that heat, or are there options? Yeah. So before we quite go there, I wanted to highlight one more thing. So if you have you have to look at the construction of the enclosure, right? So convection is typically not as effective as conduction. So mm -hmm. when you put the camera, typically you have some sort of a, a back plate that you're removing, and you have some 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 slide that you move uh, that you mount the camera on. Um, primarily, folks consider that the, the folks that make the enclosure they consider that slide just a mechanical mounting provision for the camera because it it has to sit somewhere secure at a at a predictable position inside that enclosure, right, facing the front window. Yeah. So the primary concern is, okay, this is just a mechanical mounting provision. That's great, but it also has, it doubles up as a heat sink, right? So you're now mounting the metal of the camera to um, the actual, that little slide, and now it's starting to conduct heat. But if that's not very effectively done in terms of the interface between the camera enclosure, the, the mounting surfaces to each other, um, sometimes it's just like stamped metal. So the surfaces are very, like slightly bent, you know? So hmm. when you would really like, you press the stuff together, um, the surfaces that actually contact each other, the surface area is very poor, right? So now you're not really conducting very well. So what you're left with is a complete convection situation, right? Whereas if you have a higher end sort of an enclosure, it will it will make that surface area a very good conducting surface and to actually draw the heat away from the camera and then bring that heat into the, body of the enclosure and 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 so you you have a conduction mechanism primarily that that's conducting the heat away right so so those are like some very critical differences to understand if you have an outside heat impact but also to get rid of the inside heat sort of a thing so anyways if you're going beyond that meaning um let's say let's pick a number let's say the 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 environment is 150 200 degrees yeah on a permanent basis um that is guaranteed a territory where you cannot rely on passive cooling anymore because eventually um, the, 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 the temperature of the enclosure on the outside will reach and equivalent to, to the 200 degrees. So well, that will also mean that eventually inside it will reach 200 degrees, not mm -hmm. considering the additional heat input from the camera on the inside. So you will exceed the maximum operating temperature from the camera, right? So, and it's just a question of time and it's gonna happen rather quickly actually. So now you need to do forced cooling. Like yeah. you have to have an additional input um, of, of cold air or, or um, you know, there, there's different methodologies of cooling. So one thing, a very typical one is to do, just run compressed air into it, right? You just have a, an exchange of air to the outside. That's one option. The next level up from there is what we call a vortex cooler. That's a little device. It's a little mechanical device. Um, you, you, you put um, compressed air in and it separates hot air on one side and it outputs cooled air on the other side. It's quite an interesting device. It's not very efficient. Um, so you, you're gonna be, it's very, very, um, airflow hungry hmm. okay <laughs> you need a lot of cfms of airflow which creates cost in the operating costs right if you're running a huge industrial facility and you don't care about that extra air fine but um consider that it, it takes a lot of air um several cubic feet per minute of air going through this thing to create some cooling effect right so they come in different sizes and and you have to again you have to calculate its cooling capabilities and capacity uh, typically expressed in BTUs, which is thermal units, to actually say, okay, what is able to cool needs to exceed what it's able, or what, what, what the heat input is on, on the enclosure from the outside and the inside, right? So you need to take, uh, get rid of that heat inside. So sure. that's, a, that's a vortex cooling, right? So, and you need compressed air as an additional utility to, to be in this. Um, Another potential external cooling mechanism is uh, if you wanted to do it electrically, um, it's um, basically a TEC cooler, a thermoelectric cooler. Mm. Um, and that has a Pelchi effect where one side gets hot if you put current in and the other side gets cold. Um, so that's another option there. And you can stack them up for additional cooling. Again, not very efficient, 
um, takes a lot of electrical energy now to cool it. Um, you know, but but it's possible if you don't have air and you have electricity available, you can do something like that, right? There's other issues that you have to consider now is condensation. Uh, like with any air conditioning unit, for instance, you have to make sure that you don't create condensate inside the camera and all those kind of things. So there's some design aspects around that. Um, and then the next level up from there is actually a liquid cooled enclosure, right? It's really, uh, you're creating, the, the enclosure becomes a heat exchanger essentially. Like okay. a radiator in your car, you have a double walled enclosure and you're, you're running um, segments of, of um, tube material through the enclosure all the way around and you're running cold water through it at a certain flow rate. And that essentially draws the heat out of the enclosure and it also cools the outside of the enclosure. That's for like really hot applications. You need that. And that's actually quite efficient running, running water through it. Um, hmm. And it doesn't cost much. You can, if you have an industrial chiller, you can even recycle the water, chill it back down and then recycle it back through it. Or you just use city water, run it through and then dump it somewhere that you can do that as well. But you could have a closed loop um, circulation going on there with a, a chilling unit on it. But there's a lot of different, you know, considerations um, and um, methodologies that help you cool an enclosure. Gotcha. Gotcha. With regards to this uh, water cooling um, well, let me ask it this way at, at, at about what temperature, you know, based on your experience at about what temperature does, you know, air or, uh, vortex cooling or even, you know, thermoelectric type electrical cooling, where, where does it kind of limit out and where, where does, uh, you know, uh, water cooling start to kick in? Is there, is there certain temperature ranges where, where you find that, Hey, it's just not effective anymore and we need to go to water cooling. Yeah, again, it, what we need to consider is also the heat dissipation inside the enclosure. How hot is the camera running? If it's a fairly <laughs> cold kind of a camera, meaning you can look at the wattage of the camera. If it's like a six watt sort of a maximum, that's that's very small. But if they go up from there, some of these cameras run pretty darn hot, right? So that's already a problem to begin with. I mean, even in, in an outdoor, a simple outdoor enclosure, I have cameras that do tend to overheat. If I just plainly put them in an outdoor enclosure, they will not make it in the long run just because they're running so hot. So if I pick the wrong enclosure, they just create their own thermal runaway because they produce more heat um, in, in the air in, trapped inside the enclosure. Yeah. If there's no airflow, um, it, it will create a thermal runaway, especially on a warm day, right? So So it really depends on the circumstances and we have to consider that but generally speaking and i'm making a very general statement here let's say if the environmental temperature is really just outdoors right let's say it doesn't on on an absolute brutal day in arizona maybe 120 f right you can typically in a camera that runs decently cold uh, less than 10 watt sort of a camera in an enclosure, you can get away with passive cooling. Like in other words, the, the, the enclosure itself is fine with yeah. a sun shield. You're good. Right. And then also you have to, you, you have to consider the maximum um, operating temperature. Let's say if it is 120, 125 F on the camera, it's the maximum operating temperature. You typically okay. Um, um, with a, it's kind of borderline, but you're typically okay uh, running the camera without any additional cooling methods. Okay. If you go a step up from there and say, okay, it, it's it's above that 110, 120 degrees environment, let's say 150 to 180 F in in some hotter industrial environment, then you want to switch to at least a vortex cooling situation, right? You got to bring in some extra cold air, otherwise you're going to cook the camera. Got Anything it. above 180, 200 degrees, you want to switch over to liquid cooling because the vortex is again also not going to keep up you, i mean you can you can size up and up and up on on the vortex but the problem is you're going to run 12 15 20 cfm through this thing and and the inefficiencies are just going to be um, unsurmountable at this point where it just makes sense to switch over to cooled water yeah uh, because the efficiency is so much better at that point right yeah um so yeah, and then there becomes also an upper limit when when the process just gets hotter and hotter. Even a water cooled um, situation is not going to cut it anymore. You have to have additional cooling. You have to have heat shields around the enclosure 
uh, heat insulation so that you don't have direct radiated heat hitting the enclosure. Um, you know, so th there's there's an upper limit to things as well. You can't just put it in in a 900 degree or uh, uh, you know increase here and there. Like, well, we have to put the camera inside an oven. Well, okay, but <laughs> you know there, there's lim there's practical <laughs> limits. I mean, special engineering projects. If you have multiple layers of cooling and all those kind of things, you, you can probably do that. You get also issues then with the um, the optical the the exotic uh, optics on the viewing glass because now you have to consider you have to cool the glass, but even in an oven environment, the the, the front window may not survive this either. So. You know, usually it's better to have a viewing window on the process, cooling that down and have the camera sitting on the outside rather than, you know, having all of it trying to get everything inside. That's kind of uh, tough to do, you know. Yeah, no, that makes sense, Marcus. Um, when, when it comes to, um, let's say, explosive environments, and mm -hmm. we're talking about environments that require you know, intrinsically safe or ATEX or class one, div two, those are some of the, the different uh, uh, rating systems that are out there with regards to uh, equipment in hazardous environments. What, what are the options for infrared cameras? Are there options for infrared cameras? Yeah, that's, a, that's definitely a specialty case. Um, you see maybe for um, listeners that, that are not that familiar with it. So there's environments out there um, primarily in the oil and gas environment, where you have you may have um, explosive materials in the environment, and this could be those could be solids. Um, but in the oil and gas, it's most of the time it's gases, flammable gases, right? And you want to make sure you're not accidentally creating an ignition source. Hmm. So a camera that runs hot in an enclosure, depending on the flash point of the gas in the environment, could be considered an ignition source, right? Uh, so can be any sort of ionized sort of a spark if you create a, a shortcut accidentally in the in, uh, electronics or the electronics fail and create a spark. Those things need to be protected from so that they cannot create that ignition source and therefore an explosion. There's there's essentially three levels of um, what we call, you know, loosely X-proof, explosion-proof, right? So what does it mean? So there's the explosion containment methodology. An explosion containment, those are these NEMA 12, NEMA 12X sort of enclosures that are extremely thick walled, half an inch thick, and they have bolts every inch, every couple of inches. They basically say if there is an, an, an ingress of an explosive material and there's an ignition source inside the enclosure causing an explosion inside the enclosure, it needs to be able to contain that explosion inside the enclosure without becoming an ignition source to the outside environment. So that basically means is they can literally have a full explosion inside the enclosure. The window cannot blow out. So the window is typically also like 10, 12 millimeters thick. Hmm. And, and that makes this whole thing a monster. It's like super heavy, super thick, super expensive, especially for thermal applications it's it's outrageously expensive because you would have to have like a 10 12 millimeter sort of a germanium window like a really like a big block of the germanium there that's really expensive and it's also attenuating your signal quite dramatically so it's it's not a really good um i mean it, it they exist but it, it's a very expensive proposition there right mm. so so that's and then they're they're constructed in such a way that if they do have an explosion well you can't just create an explosive pressure that pressure needs to be released so typically the the gaskets in those enclosures are designed to release that pressure over time without having sparks coming out um so anyway that's that's an explosion uh, uh containment uh, methodology and then we have the intrinsically safe approach. So there's three approaches, right? The, the explosion prevent, I'm sorry, explosion containment, the intrinsically safe one, that's basically saying everything inside is encapsulated in, in resins, in whatever, and it also has, um, it does not exceed a certain power threshold, um, which could cause um, sparking, if you will. So there's a certain energy calculation in joules to say, even if I create a shortcut, it cannot create a spark 
uh, with high enough energy to become an, ex um, uh, an explosion or like an ignition source. So those are intrinsically safe cameras. They, they exist that you can okay. put on there. Um, and then the third one um, is an explosion prevention. And that's the most common one used. And ex explosion prevention just says, we're going to create an environment inside the enclosure. That's true for camera enclosures or electrical cabinets, for instance, um, where we purge the, the, the inside. So the purging happens up on startup. So in case you did have an ingress of explosive materials such as gases or, or solids, fibers, whatever it is, um, they will be purged out first. And then you turn the equipment on while the, the environment is pressurized a little bit over ambient. So the idea there is even if the enclosure has a leak, since you have a positive pressure compared to the outside environment, uh, only things can go out of the enclosure and nothing can come in. <laughs> and there are special perch and pressurization controllers that we can add to these enclosures. Um, and that is basically an explosion prevention method, right? Okay. And okay. then there's different, um, it's a whole nother subject on its own. There's different classifications and groups. Um, you know, there, there's class one, diff one, class one, diff two, class two, diff one, class two, diff two. And then there's different subgroups that, that specify what sort, what is, what type of explosive materials are in the area. Are those solids, are those fibers, dust, um, are those grains, uh, let's say, uh, flour in, in the food production, are those gases, and, and what are they, right? And then there's temperature groups that basically specify what is their flash point, you know, and all those kind of things. So it gets quite involved in, in that area. Um, so, you know, those, those are kind of, you know, the... the the typical candidates for those X-proof uh, sort of environments. Yeah, it sounds like if you're dealing with one of those environments, it would be a great idea to consult with with someone who has expertise in this space again to make sure that well, you're you're protecting your investment in your cameras, but also maybe even most importantly the the environment in which it's operating in the people that are also working within that environment. Which you just touched on something which was amazing to me to learn this because automatically I think, yeah, oil and gas explosion proof. I need this type of enclosure, but even in certain food industries and packaging you 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 need to have explosion proof and you touched on this briefly you mentioned dust i i don't know maybe can you can you just comment on that uh, a little little further you know based on your experience you know what are some of those non oil and gas environments where yes you still need to consider explosion proof absolutely yeah so a lot of dust particles if they if they come in a a dense enough sort of a, an occurrence if you will right if uh, they become uh, they can become explosive even spices right if you take cinnamon for instance and you would take cinnamon and 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 grab a handful of cinnamon and just throw it up in the air i mean don't do it don't try this at home <laughs> and you have an you have an ignition source you're creating an explosion right the same thing with flour um, yeah so Typically grains, anything that has some oil components in it and, and, and you dust it up, it's, it's, a, it's a combustion mixture. Um, you know, you have the right mixture between oxygen, uh, like an accelerator, an, an oxidizer and, and, um, and combustible material. You have the right mixture and, and you're in trouble, you know. So, yeah, so you have this there. Um, people have probably, well, yeah, there, there's fertilizers that fall into that category, um, you know, ammonia-based materials. I mean, they're, they're very flammable to begin with um, uh, any sort of paint booth applications automotive um, mm -hmm. they have robots spraying paint over it the uh, lacquer thinner that's in there the acetone you know all those kind of chemicals there I mean there's a lot of different explosive uh, sort of environments around and they differentiate between is this stuff around under normal operating conditions then it's a then it's a division one uh, it's it's basically always there. And yeah. that requires different methodologies of protection versus the div two division two means it's only there in under abnormal conditions if there's a leak or something spills and and so the risk is categorized a little bit lower than the div one so those are things um you know class two basically says it's a solid combustible material fibers and grains and all those kind of things uh class one always refers to gases 
and gases. Class one diff one is the most dangerous one. It's basically saying there's explosive gases around under normal operating condition in a high enough concentration that any ignition source will instantaneously create an explosion. Yeah. So that's obviously uh, ultra, ultra dangerous, right? So you cannot mess around with that in any shape or form. That's certainly not a do-it-yourself sort of a topic. <laughs> we actually have to use computerized perch and pressurization systems uh, with a lot of safety mechanisms in it to make sure nothing can go wrong in those environments it gets really expensive you yeah. know because it's obviously you're protecting a lot of things i mean people can lose their lives if if this goes wrong right yeah yeah marcus um building a little more upon the you know dusty environment uh we we've talked about this before we hit on it briefly here a little bit with regards to uh attenuation of the the thermal signal uh in the camera, which is going to impact your measurements and your results. So uh, you have one of these enclosures and let's say you've covered all your bases with regards to whether it's explosion proof or not. And those, those needs from a dustiness perspective, what are options available to make sure you're, you know, not again, uh, uh, reducing or attenuating the signal uh, to the infrared camera sensor because of dust collecting on the surface of the enclosure. What are, what are some options there? Yeah, great question. Um, so dust as well as grime sometimes, right? Mm. Grime and even liquid sometimes, moisture and those kind of things. Anything that can accumulate on the front window will eventually be strong enough to attenuate your, your thermal signature, right? So what when you look through the camera's eye, stuff will become more blurry. It looks like it's out of focus, but it may actually be um, that there's stuff... Um, accumulated on top of the viewing glass. So protection mechanisms, there are what we call air knives. Um, they are basically air nozzles that are pointed towards the glass. And, and there's a couple of different um, methodologies there as, as well. So either you have a permanent airflow that prevents these materials from settling in the first place, but there's also the, um, the, the occasional puff that's usually sitting on a timer that puffs every five minutes and does a strong air puff hmm. and just removes stuff on a constant basis, right? So those are two things um, you can do. Um, good preventative uh, measures are, can you, can you point the camera down at an angle rather than up so that uh, you work against the gravity kind of a situation? If stuff settles, you don't want to have a camera pointing up. Sometimes that's unavoidable. We had a situation in, in, a, in a steel factory where the camera enclosure was looking straight up and the debris was falling down. That's, that's not wow. a good situation. So this was um, inherited in, in, in the regular maintenance plan where they had to clean the window. There was just, you know, if the particles become too heavy, uh, that's another problem too. You can also have damages on your window if stuff falls down. Um, so those kind of things. Sometimes you can deal with um, mirrors and um, mm -hmm. we had, um, a, a metal shredding application and every once in a while it was pieces of fragments of metals flying around like bullets um, and they would destroy the front window um, you know of the enclosure because it was literally like a bullet getting through the glass so there we did um, like a 45 or 90 degree uh, mirror if you will with a replaceable not as expensive material um, so they could replace that and put it back in if it got banged up too bad but it would protect the camera and the enclosure window. So those are things you can you can kind of try to do there. Yeah, there's a lot of <laughs> when we say harsh environment, we we mean harsh environments. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's interesting. <laughs> and when you're utilizing, you know, let's say the continuous air, the air puff, you also need to be careful about the type of air, right? The quality of the air that you're you're putting on this window. Yes. Yeah. Very another very good point. So we typically call it uh, instrumentation air. Okay. So when you we we'll have to do a little excursion into compressed air generation. So there's air compressors out there, and there there's different types. Um, and um, some of them um, they have actually uh, oil uh, on the pistons that compress the air. And and some of like in your car, a little bit of that oil mist makes it into the compressed air chamber, right? Um, so then that mist of oil travels um, in the airline. So you don't want to use uh, you know, unseparated uh, uh, air and, and blow this 
either inside the, the, the camera enclosure and then you know have an oil film building up on the inside or on the outside, right? So you need you need an oil separator, you need also an air dryer mm-hmm. or a water separator to make sure that you have dry and clean um, air going in and, and ideally uh, filter size down to a micron, one micron, two micron sort of a filter size is usually recommended for these applications. So you don't um, blow any other contaminants into the stuff, right? Yeah, okay. Excellent. Marcus, I think I think we've covered uh, what we had uh, planned for in today's conversation, but I'm, I'm sure we have listeners who may still have questions, may still require some guidance uh, with regards to, again, making sure they're selecting the right enclosure for their camera and their environment. What should they do? Well, we're always here. Uh, we're, <laughs> we're, always, we're always geeking out about those kind of topics. So we're more than happy to, to help folks out. Uh, um, you know, if, if you call us, do some homework up front and figure out, okay, wh- what, is, what is the environment like that I want to put the camera in, right? Yeah. And think about what is my temperature, right? If I'm not sure, maybe take a thermo- th- thermometer out there and, and say at the installation point where I'm planning to putting the camera enclosure, what is the temperature there? So that's good to know because sometimes you'll be surprised, right? You're like, yeah, it's going to be roughly this, but it's well, maybe it's 20, 30 degrees warmer. Um, have handy, what, which camera do you want to put in there? Yeah. What are the specs? Like have a spec sheet to share about the camera so we can figure out mechanical size of the camera, what kind of a lens is on there so we can match up the window size because if it's a very wide angle, we need a larger window size. You know, that's a, that's a thing too. And then what's the power consumption on the camera so we can calculate the heat dissipation inside of the enclosure, right? So we, we, we recommend the right enclosure there. Um, and any other things we need to, is, is it a you know, class one, diff two, is it an explosive sort of an environment or not, right? How harsh does it get? Like what's the environment like in terms of debris, any sort of contamination and all those kind of things. So the more the more stuff like this, what you learn today, hopefully in the podcast that you can gather up front the, the quicker we can help, you know. Absolutely. Great, great guidance, Marcus. Thank you. And uh, to our listeners, thank you for, for joining us today. Uh, I believe we've uh, we accomplished our goal and objective of illuminating, if you will, this subject around enclosures and taking those points that Marcus wrapped up here with, uh, well said, uh, and give us a call. In fact, if you come to the, the MobiTherm website, you'll find that the website is broken down into different sections. And one of the sections is around products. Uh, One is solutions. If you go to the products tab, uh, that will take you to enclosures. And you can see what enclosures are available uh, from MobiTherm. A a chat box will pop up. And if you have questions and need some guidance or want someone to call you or talk to you, just, just respond to that chat or click on the button to contact me and, and we will have one of our experts uh, reach out. And if you have those, those items prepared that Marcus touched on here, yeah, we'll be able to guide you through the process and make sure that you have the right enclosure for the right camera, for the right uh, conditions. Thanks for joining us today on the Thermal Review Podcast. We hope you found this previously recorded interview with Marcus Taran enlightening. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe and don't forget to share it with your fellow thermographers. As always, if you have any questions or topics you'd like us to explore in future episodes, feel free to reach out. Until next time, stay safe, stay informed, and keep capturing the heat. 